Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I want to encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up your copy of An Ounce of Prevention. It is available for the Kindle and also as an audiobook through audible.com. It's my first detective story in which Private Detective Jerry Newton gets more than he bargains for when he pr- agrees to provide protection to an elementary school teacher and faces the toughest decision of his life. Pick up an ounce of prevention, uh, and it's available at Amazon, Audible, or through store.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Michael Shane. Original air date, July the 23rd, 1945. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. We all know that our detective friend Mike Shane is the hardest working member of his profession in San Francisco. We all know that he's a dynamo of energy in his tireless pursuit of the criminal. But at the moment, it seems the criminal is in pursuit of Mike. His assistant, Phyllis Knight, ushers into the office two rather odd characters. Uh, Mr. Shane, my name is Belsey, George Belsey, Jr. My friend here, Richard Stowe. How do you do, Mr. Shane? I'm glad to know both of you. Gentlemen, my associate, Miss Knight. Hello. How do you do? A pleasure. Mr. Shane, this is a very peculiar business call. I might say it took considerable persuasion on my part to get Mr. Stowe to come here this afternoon. Oh, well, it's so embarrassing. We handle many embarrassing problems, Mr. Stowe. Dick's problem is more than embarrassing. It's almost driving him crazy. You see, Dick is afraid he's going to murder me. Murder? Could we have that last chorus again? Well, (laughs) I don't blame you, sir. Dick thinks he is going to murder me. Uh, Mr. Stowe is going to murder you. (laughs) At least I'm afraid I might. This is not a practical joke, Mr. Shane. Nor I'll be crazy. I, I'm not sure just when it started. I, I've been very upset in recent months. I guess I brooded too much. I'll say he did. Dick got so bad, I finally dragged him down to a psychiatrist friend of mine, Dr. Neiman. Mm-hmm. Neiman, yes, I've heard of him. Well, the doctor seemed to help me for a while. My health improved. But then I, I began having this dream. It's always the same dream. It never varies in any detail. It's, it's the perfect crime. I kill Mr. Belsey in such a way that the police are completely baffled. Which could happen only in a dream, but uh, go on, go on. Well, George Belsey's office is up in the Commerce Building. On the ground floor is a cocktail lounge. Well, I dream that about 8 o'clock at night I go into the bar. I order a drink. I drink half of it. I tell the bartender I'm out of cigarettes. I go out to the lobby, but I don't buy cigarettes. I slip through the door on the left and hurry down a hall. I get into the freight elevator. Room 707 is right in front of the elevator. I open the door. I walk through two offices. George Belsey's room is the third. I see the light shining through his glass door. George is working tonight. I take out my revolver. I open his door gently, quietly, just a crack. George is behind his desk. It takes just one bullet. I close the door, wipe off the doorknob, and run back to the elevator. In a minute, I step up to the bar again. I ask the bartender to light my cigarette. I finish my drink. And the dream is over. Well, that's really something for the scrapbook. Well, the dream is so horribly vivid that sometimes I don't know whether I've dreamed it or actually done it. I see. And you want me to set your mind at rest, Mr. Stowe? All right, I think I can show you why you couldn't commit a perfect crime. First, uh, Mr. Belsey, are the bar, the freight elevator, and your office situated as in the dream? Yes, they are. Dick has been up to my office often enough to have the details straight. Mr. Stowe, would you have any motive to kill Mr. Belsey? Oh, no, not the slightest. Are you in any business deals together? No, my line is mining. Dick's is wholesale hardware. Mm -hmm. Mr. Belsey, do you work at your office every night? Oh, no, very seldom. No matter how carefully a murder is planned, there's always the danger of something unforeseen. Mr. Stowe would have to know which night you're working. Then somebody might notice him sneak out of the lobby. 
Uh, an operator might be working after hours on the freight elevator. And then there's the scrub woman upstairs to avoid, and the gun to dispose of afterwards. Yes. No matter what gun you use, the police would trace the bullet. You'd have to prepare yourself against all these slip-ups and a dozen others. <laughs> well, now, does that take a load off your mind? Uh, uh, yes, it, it does. And if you dream it again, Dick, just laugh at it, roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> well, really, I do feel better already. George, we'd better not take up any more Mr. Sheen's time. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, we want to pay you. No, forget it. I don't charge for just talking. Oh, you've done more than that, Mr. Sheen. You've pointed out my mistakes. You've told me how to commit the perfect crime. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to meet you, sir. And Miss Knight. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, goodbye. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Well, this is just fine. Mike Shane, consultant on murder. Hand me that phone book. Who are you going to call? Who do you think? That psychiatrist. Of course I understand, Mr. Shane. Mr. Stowe has been my patient for months, but there is no cause to be alarmed. Well, the way he talked, Dr. Neiman, I, I, I just wondered if he had all his buttons. Oh, there is nothing wrong with Mr. Stowe. He has had a series of especially vivid nightmares and... It has become a habit with him. There is nothing to worry about. I see. Nothing to worry about. Hmm. I hope you enjoyed your drink, sir. Yeah, very much, thank you. Here you are. Much obliged. Good night, sir. Good night. All right, honey. Let's head for the lobby. Okay. Now, let's see. Mr. Stowe said the lobby, then the door to the left. Must be this one. And there's the freight elevator. Well, we've done everything in the right order. We had a drink in the cocktail lounge, we went through the lobby, we found the freight elevator. All checks with Stowe's dreams so far. Yeah. Room 707, right in front of us. Mike, the lights are on inside. Hmm. Elsie working tonight? Through two rooms, and then his office. Mike, it, it's this next office. There's a man's shadow against the door. And it isn't Belsie's. No. Those shoulders look awfully familiar. And the angle of that hat. It's the inspector. Who's out there? Hey, Mike and Phil. What in the name Inspector, of... you're here on a murder? Why, yes. It's a man shot to death? That's right, but how did... Uh, one more question, Inspector. In that next room is a desk, and behind that desk is the body of George Belsey, Jr.? How in the name of everything did you know? Ah, I hate to tell you, Inspector. I really hate to tell you. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, nearly everyone knows about carbon and the trouble it causes in automobile engines. But what most people don't know is that the kind of motor oil they buy directly influences the amount of carbon in their engines. That's because many drivers still believe that carbon comes from the gasoline when actually nearly all carbon formed in gasoline engines comes from the lubricating oil. But, and this is the payoff, some motor oils form a great deal more carbon than others. That's why we say your carbon troubles may be due to the kind of oil you buy. Now, and this is a proved laboratory fact, Triton motor oil forms less carbon than any other of the seven leading premium oils sold in the West. Yes, that's right. Triton cuts down carbon. The secret of Triton's superiority lies in Union Oil Company's exclusive propane solvent refining process. That means harmful asphalts, waxes, and sulfur have been removed, leaving a pure 100% paraffin-based motor oil, an oil that will furnish hundreds of miles of safe, dependable lubrication. You can buy Triton motor oil at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. 
Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. A man's dream of murder has turned into a nightmare of reality for Mike Shane. In the office of the dead man, Mike and Phyllis have explained to the inspector how they knew George Belsey had been shot to death. So you and Phil were tracing Mr. Stowe's dream footsteps. That's right, Inspector. Phil and I came up here just to see if Stowe could commit the crime the way he dreamed it. And when we saw you here, the inspector of homicide, we knew what had happened. Uh-huh. It happened all right. Bullet right through Belsey's heart. Well, we'll have Stowe picked up right away. I know where he was 40 minutes ago. Uh, who's this? Frank Mann. I was in business with Belsey. Yeah, Mike. He found the body and phoned us. I saw Stowe down in the cocktail lounge about 40 minutes ago. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Go down to the cocktail lounge and have Mr. Stowe paid for a phone call. If he answers, bring him up here. If he doesn't, send a couple of men to pick him up. Right away, sir. Uh, Mr. Mann, you say you were in business with George Belsey. The mining business? Yes. I'm a mining engineer. Well, maybe you'd call me a prospector. George and I were just about to hit it rich. Now it's hopeless. Oh, why is that? Why? Well, you don't find gold mines with every blow of a pickaxe. I've rawhided over every mile of the Sierras looking for a good digging for George and me. George grub me. I found him a couple of little mines, but now I need some real cash. That's what you came here tonight to talk over with Belsey? Yes, I just got in from Nevada. Uh-huh. Hadn't seen George for, oh, five or six weeks. He was back east a while. I walk in the door tonight and... Well, you know the rest. And, uh, this is, uh, the way you found him, slumped over in his chair? That's right. You can see the bullet embedded in the back of the chair. Went clean through him. Mm-hmm. Looks like a forty-five caliber. This is, uh, Mr. Stowe, Inspector. Yeah? Found him in the bar, like you said. Where's George? Where's... Oh! Uh-huh. All right, Mr. Stowe, suppose we have your story. You were in the cocktail lounge, you went out for some cigarettes. Yes. It's, it's, just, it's just like my dream. But I didn't kill him. Inspector, I checked with the bartender. Mr. Stowe came in about an hour ago. Mm-hmm. Yes, I went out in the lobby. I even went to the freight elevator. I was just curious about my dream. But I went right back to the bar. I didn't know George was working tonight. I didn't kill him. I know I didn't. Sergeant, was he carrying a gun? No, sir. Well, if Mr. Stowe doesn't believe he did the killing, we've got to go ahead and solve the case ourselves. Now, let's see. The usual stuff on the desk here. Is a bottle of whiskey the usual? Hmm? Hmm. Bonded? Mm Mm-hmm. Must have been open recently. The label's still wet. But this one drinking glass is clean and dry. Mm Mm-hmm. Appointment pad shows Belsey's last caller was at 5 p.m. Mike, there's a a phone number jotted down. Fairfield 62041. Hey, that number. Mean anything to you, Mike? You bet it does, Inspector. I called that number this afternoon. It's Dr. Neiman. Maybe we better check up on it. Yes, and speaking of checkups, uh, how about the angle of the bullet? Was it fired from the doorway? Looks like it, though we haven't traced it yet. Well, let's do it now. Must be a good 20 feet from the desk to this door. Listen, I think I hear somebody coming. Probably the coroner. He's late. Uh-uh, that's a woman's footsteps. Mm, yes, it is. All right, miss, in this way. What's the meaning of this? Perhaps you'd better tell us. What are you doing here? I came back for something I forgot. She was Belsey's secretary, Marie Farrell. Hello, Marie. M- Mr. Mann, wh- why are these people here? In case you really don't know, look behind Mr. Belsey's desk. Oh, then it happened. Mr. Stowe's dream. No, Marie, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. Miss Farrell, do you know anybody else who might want to kill Mr. Belsey? Why, no. Mr. Stowe kept dreaming about it, but nobody would have a reason. Well, we don't think anybody killed him for the pure sport of it. You say, Miss Farrell, you came back to the office because you forgot something? What was it? I... I I can't remember. You've forgotten what you forgot in the first place? Oh, I remember. I'm so mixed up. The the theater tickets. I was on my way to the theater with some friends. They must be wondering what happened to me. Well, I guess there's no point now keeping you. We can always find you. (sighs) Yes, then... I'll get the tickets. They're in my desk. We may want to talk to you tomorrow, Miss Farrell. So if you'll give the sergeant your address and phone number. Oh, of course. Marie Farrell, Calistoga Apartments, Dawson, 90351. I, well, I guess that's all. Good night. Now, where were we? Oh, yes, yes. Checking the angle of the bullet. Sergeant, you might take Mr. Stone and Mr. Mann to the next room and let them dictate their stories. Yes, sir. This way, please, gentlemen. Mike. 
Look at this. Hmm? I found Belsie's account books in this desk drawer. Uh, let's see, Phil. Hmm. Partnership, Belsie and Mann. Gold shipment. Huh. Mike, from these figures, I'd say they were doing all right for themselves. Mike. What? How's this little item for the third finger left hand? An engagement ring. Where did you find it? In this middle drawer. Look at this newspaper with it. Photograph with the blue penciling around it. Uh, Miss Carly Schaefer announces her engagement to Mr. George Belsey, Jr. of San Francisco. Hmm? Right good-looking gal. It's a Pittsburgh paper three days ago. It must have been mailed to Belsey. Wait a minute. Huh? Hey, kids, look at this picture again. Huh. Miss Carly's showing her engagement ring to some girlfriends. But now the ring is here in San Francisco. Uh-uh, it's not the same ring. It's smaller, a different cut. Oh, how can you tell? It's only a newspaper photo. All right, look at it through this magnifying glass. Mm-hmm. Phil's right, Inspector. The Pittsburgh gal is wearing Belsie's engagement ring, yet he's got another piece of Cupid's ice in his desk drawer. For whom? Marie Farrell. Maybe she was after this ring. Could be. I think we'd better have a real heart-to-heart talk with that young lady, and right now. Uh Uh-uh, Mike, you forgot. She's gone to the theater. All the better, my dear. Meanwhile, we can have a look around her apartment. Sergeant. Yes, sir? We're going to see Miss Farrell, the Calistoga Apartments. Looks like our little canary is about to fly her cage. Uh-huh. Suitcase all packed. Hmm. Looks like she's traveling light. Unless she has other bags. Dresses, blouses, stockings, slips. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> perhaps I'd better take the inventory. Here. Yeah. Hey, hold it, hold it. Here's a letter. Return address, George Belsey Jr., State Hotel, Pittsburgh. Okay, okay. Read the letter. Hmm. Written last week. Dearest Marie, I'll be back in San Francisco by Saturday, but there's something I want you to know before that. You remember a girl I used to know here in Pittsburgh? Her name is Coralie Schaefer. The good old-fashioned jilt. Yeah. It seems Coralie is the one and only for him. Then Phil was right. The engagement ring in Belsie's desk did belong to Marie. Do you think the jilted young lady might soothe her feelings with a well-placed bullet in her ex-boyfriend? Marie told us there was no reason why anyone should want to kill Belsie, yet... She's got the only motive for murder we've found so far. Yeah, but you can pile motives up to the ceiling, and Richard Stowe will still look like the murderer. That's true, Inspector. He had the dream, and the killing was exactly as he told it to us. I'm not saying he didn't do it. In fact, there's one angle which may pin it right on him without motive or intent to kill. Meaning what, Mike? Meaning that we've all forgotten Dr. Neiman. The psychiatrist? Yes. And I think we should swap complexes and phobias with that gentleman. Well, you kids go ahead. I'm waiting right here for Marie. She's got to come home sometime tonight. Well, we're not going to leave you here alone. Oh, 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 listen, Grandma. I'm not helpless. I was with Homicide while you were still playing in the sandbox. Okay, Inspector. Okay. Come on, honey. Do you know where uh, Dr. Neiman lives, Mike? Well, we'll get it from the phone book, but first, uh, we're stopping by my apartment. There's something I want to have when we visit Dr. Neiman. <laughs> Of course I remember you, Mr. Shane. You telephoned this afternoon about Mr. Stowe. May I ask, Dr. Neiman, if Mr. Stowe has talked to you this evening? No. What do you ask? Oh, curiosity. I am interested in that nightmare which has been troubling Stowe. The details of the dream to kill Mr. Belsey was so complete. I asked, Doctor, when Stowe was talking to us, he seemed to think it was the perfect crime. So? The perfect crime? In fact, Doctor, it looks like the dream was too much uh, of a temptation for Mr. Stowe. Belsie has been murdered. Tonight? Yes. In the same manner? In the same manner. Uh, Will you have a cigarette, Miss Knight? Uh, No. Thank you. I understand, Doctor, that Mr. Belsie brought Stowe to you to help him out of a bad mental state. Yes. He was morbid about his business affairs. I might say he was on the verge of a neurotic collapse. Uh, I helped him considerably. How, may I ask? Oh, by various technical means. I'm afraid Mr. Stowe's mind was not quite balanced. That's not what you told me this afternoon, Doctor. You said he was all right, that there was nothing to worry about. How was I to know he would do such an insane thing? Doctor, in treating Mr. Stowe, did you use hypnotism? Yes, occasionally. I know what you are thinking, Mr. Shane, but you are wrong. It is impossible to hypnotize a man to commit murder. 
You can't hypnotize anyone into violating his code of ethics. Uh Uh-huh, I see. Doctor, I brought along a copy of one of your books, Exercises in Psychiatry. I'd like to read you something you wrote on page 93. 93. Oh, I think I know what it is. Quite possibly. This is it. Modern psychologists maintain that a person hypnotized cannot be made to perform acts which violate his ordinary standards of conduct and morality. However, I suggest that if the patient is first convinced by hypnotism that he has no standard of morality, he can be made to follow out any order, even if it be murder. You can't hold that against me. What I wrote eight years ago, I've uh, tested my theory and I found I was wrong. How did you test your theory, Doctor? And uh, can you explain why Mr. Stowe did not have this dream of murder till after you began to treat him? Mr. Shane, I refuse to be dragged into this mess. If you try to smear my reputation in this town, I promise you, you'll regret it very sorely. Very well, Dr. Neiman. Then I think we'll be going. You uh, haven't been what I call helpful. I am not required to be. No. No, but if Mr. Stowe is proved guilty of murder... You may find yourself named accessory to the crime. Think that over, Doctor. Why so quiet, Mike? Thinking. When I look back on it, I think Newman knew what happened from the moment we walked into the door. But, Mike, even if Mr. Stowe was hypnotized to commit a murder, how are we going to prove it? Mike? Mike, what's wrong? We're being followed. Where? No, 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 don't turn around, don't turn around. Look in the rear vision mirror. I saw that same Suzanne behind us when we started over Twin Peaks. Mike, you you don't think... We'll find out, honey. I'm going to swing into this alley. It passed right by. Yeah, Maybe I'm just getting jumpy. To play safe, we'll go over to another street. Oh, I couldn't see who was in the car. Did you? No. No, it's so dark we... Phil. I see it. It turned around. It's right behind us. Duck, honey. Duck! In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. Friends, with the hottest part of summer yet to come, it's a good idea to make sure that the cooling system of your automobile is working properly. You see, aside from the fact that it makes driving uncomfortable, a motor, when too hot, wastes gasoline. And whether you realize it or not, cars driven around town with frequent starts and stops usually get hotter than those driven on the open road. Now, an easy way to make sure your radiator is on the job and cooling your engine is to have your Union Oil Minuteman treat it with Union Radiator Flush. Union Radiator Flush is harmless to metal, but its special solvent action cuts scale, rust, and grease right out of choked radiator cores and water lines. Then, with a radiator that is flushed clean, you can be sure of rapid water circulation and a cool motor. So for cooler driving, economical mileage, ask for Union Oil Radiator Service, wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. One of the bullets fired into Mike Shane's car came near its mark. Mike was hit in the shoulder. Phyllis has bandaged the wound, and the two are now back at the scene of the murder, the office of George Belsey. How are you feeling now, Mike? Oh, a little rocky, but okay, Inspector. It was just a flesh wound. We'll have a doctor dress it properly. You better, Phil. Oh, Mike, the sergeant has just brought in Neiman. We got everybody back here now. Stone, Man, and Marie. Have you got anything out of Marie? Yeah, admit she and Belsie broke their engagement. But there's a funny twist to it. We didn't notice when she was here earlier she was wearing another engagement ring. You mean the one we found in the desk didn't belong to Marie? Looks that way, Phil. She froze up when I asked her about the one she was wearing. Have you checked up on where everybody was at the time I got shot? Yeah, they all got alibis. It's up to us to find out which one is lying. That's what bothers me, Inspector. Somebody tried to kill me because he or she thinks I know the answer to this case, and doggone it, I don't. All right, I'll bring them all in now, and we can sweat them. All right, Sergeant. Say, Sergeant. Yes, sir? Open that door again, please. Yes, sir. Well, I'll be... 
Inspector, what? there must be something wrong with our ears. We've opened and closed that door 40 times tonight. Well, what about it, Mike? What about it? Well, listen to it. There. Don't you see? The killer couldn't possibly open this door to fire his gun without Belsey hearing him. Mm. Let me show you. I'll step outside the office and close the door and then open it again. What's the matter, Mike? I can't see the desk. Look. Look, the door has to be completely open before I can see the desk. That means the killer practically had to come into the room. I catch. Belsey must have seen him, but he didn't jump up or try to escape. He just sat there, paralyzed with fright. Wait a minute. We've skipped a big point here. Belsey was hit by a forty-five bullet. That would knock an elephant sideways. Yet he stayed there in his chair. Yeah, you're right. The nervous reflex alone would make him jump out of his seat. Unless he was unconscious. Inspector, what? we've assumed all along that the whiskey and drinking glass on the desk were unused. I'll bet my gold bridge worked that the killer cleaned and dried that glass. Belsey took a drink that was drugged. That's possible, but there's still the main question. Of who did it? All right. Mr. Stowe dreamed of the killing. Marie, I believe you indicated that you knew of his dream. Well, yes. Mr. Stowe talked about it so much. And Dr. Neiman knew it, of course. And you, Mr. Mann? Well, Belsey joked about it with me once or twice. So everybody knew of Stowe's dream and could take advantage of it. But here's the point. I practically accused Dr. Neiman of hypnotizing Stowe to commit the murder. I still deny it. And I believe you, sir. I've been thinking it over the past few minutes. Dr. Neiman has never been in this office. We checked on it. He couldn't possibly hypnotize Mr. Stowe and give him all those detailed directions about the cocktail lounge and the freight elevator. Yeah, that makes sense. The same reason would rule out Mr. Stowe. If he killed Belsey, he would do it exactly as he dreamed it, which is not the way the murder was committed. No, Mike has demonstrated that. Huh? By the opening and closing of the door, and by the probability that Belsey was drugged. Marie, Marie, you are the prize suspect except for two things. You didn't know Belsey was working tonight because the last appointment jotted down on his desk pad was for 5 p.m. And you were not in your apartment when Miss Knight and I decided to call on Dr. Neiman. So you couldn't have followed Mike there or tried to kill him afterwards. But that also goes for Frank Mann. Not quite, Inspector. He did hear us say we were going to Marie's apartment. He followed us first to her place and then to Neiman's no, and... No, no, you're wrong, wrong. Frank wouldn't kill Belsey. He's not a murderer. Oh, so now it's Frank. Oh. You've dropped the formality. Miss Farrell, that engagement ring you're wearing, Frank Mann gave it to you, didn't he? Yes. We're going to be married. I suppose you'll make a crime out of that, too. It's a very expensive ring, several thousand dollars. If you're broke, Mr. Mann, and Belsie was grub-staking you, you couldn't possibly afford that ring unless you knew you were taking over the gold mines of your dead partner. You, you can't prove a thing. You can't convict me. You've convicted yourself, sir. You were the only one who knew Belsie was working tonight because you had an appointment with him. You killed him, then called the police. Well, the police are still here, ready and waiting. How about it, Inspector? Mike? Huh? How do you want your eggs? Oh, let's have them sunny side up this time, huh? You know, with this bum arm of mine, Angel, you'll have to feed your poor old boss. And how you'll love it. <laughs> Uh-oh, I bet that's the inspector. Hey, wait, wait. I want to hear this, too. Hello? <laughs> yeah, you guessed right, inspector. She's fixing me some eggs. What bacon? Huh? <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. It's in my pocket. I guess I was just absent-minded. Sure, sure. I'll bring it in tomorrow. Okay. Good night, Inspector. What will you bring in tomorrow? Oh, that engagement ring we found in Belsie's desk. I stuck it in my pocket here and walked off with it. Forgot all about it. Uh, yeah, I know how that is. Huh? When it comes to engagement rings, your mind is a complete blank. Ah, Angel, you walked off with something of mine, too, tonight. This book on psychiatry here. Oh, that. Hey, wait a minute. You've dog-eared a page already. Chapter on... Hypnotism and its power over the emotions. You give me that book. <laughs> You're wasting your time, give honey. It, it doesn't work. I've already tried it. <laughs> J. 
Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. An interesting plot, though I'm not certain the way that uh, psychologist phrased his theory about being hypnotized not to have uh, morality. People can uh, be brainwashed, which I guess is a little bit of a different uh, endeavor. But at any rate, we turn to listener comments and uh, feedback. And Kate says, this is my first time listening to Michael Shane, and I really enjoyed this episode. I've loved and collected OTR for years and have never heard the series. The Minutemen commercials were fun, too. Well, thanks so much, Kate. Um, and yeah, as I've mentioned before, uh, until about two years ago, this was a series with a very small number of episodes circulating. This version of Michael Shane used to have just five episodes uh, running around, and now we're in the midst of a 28-week run. So that, that definitely does give me hope um, for, uh, you know, when I do think of all the Lost series out there. There's some interesting ones to be discovered, and some that will hopefully sound even better once we find a, a few more episodes. And finally, we have a tweet from Jim who says, Just bought Slime Incorporated. Thanks for the podcast. Cheers. Well, thanks so much for uh, picking up uh, Slime Incorporated. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for The Avenger. And next Monday, it's another episode of Michael Shane. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become...